So this is a talk I put together a decade ago, and it turns out that I didn't have the right audience at that time to, to do, do it justice. So I'm really happy to give it now. Um, and this is exactly the right crowd for this stuff, although now some of the slides are dated. So we'll just have to work through what's dated here. Um, so you know, some history here. Uh, Hotspot started out a long time ago as the self VM um, ported to Java. And it had a you know, serial, single-threaded, stop the world GC, uh, a simple stage zero JIT, maybe, if you want to call it. Single-threaded, multi-threading was a much later addition. It was x86 only. The Spark hardware team paid money for a port to Spark, was the second port, if you could call the x86 only thing a port. Um, I've been working on Hotspot for about 20 years. The last three years I've taken off and been doing some unrelated stuff. Um, but I have a long history with it. I watched it become very robust. I watched a ton of ports. I participated in most of those ports. Um, I worked on uh, C2, obviously, but I did tons of compiler infrastructure and shared infrastructure all throughout the, G, uh, the VM. I watched a bunch of new GC show up, including people having different requirements for what, out of the one of the jitted code as it relates to the GC. And then a bunch of other stuff here, reflection and thin locks and uh, Java memory model and JNI code and on and on and on. OK, so the, the nature of this talk. So this talk is about looking at the kinds of decisions that you end up making when you build a VM. And, uh, and a lot of these are, are hard won experience for which uh, this is exactly the right audience to understand what those choices are and why. Um, and so the, the, the things that, that I'm going to point out here is that many of these topics I'm going to cover here, um, you optimize for, you work very hard, you engineer hard to make something go either ultimately fast or low power or small footprint or whatever it's going to be. And these choices you're making are going to interlock badly in funny, non-obvious ways. And suddenly you get in, down this rat hole where you're stuck and you have to redo some critical piece of infrastructure in order to make some you know, next gain in performance or power, or whatever it's going to be. So I have lots and lots of things I can talk about. Um, I'm happy to stop for questions. Um, so you know, if, someone's, if you're confused, someone else is too, stop and ask me. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to talk at this kind of a speed all the way through. Do it, do faster, it. Faster. OK, some choices to make. So VMs are, are big, complicated beasties, or, or maybe not. Maybe they're really, really small and tiny things. And it kind of depends on your feature set. And many of the features that go into JVMs um, interact in bad ways that bring up the complexity. And the interactions are often not obvious coming in. I just said that. I went the big desktop server route. But it turns out to be very different choices from, I'm going to say, cell phone guys. This is the dated topic. It's, Something small form factor embedded. If you know what your target audience is, if you know what your target problem is, if you have complete control of the whole world scenario with your native code, then many of the decisions that are hard uh, can be solved completely easily, completely casually. Um, if you, if you want to handle like, all possible versions of native code, all possible uh, scenarios of threading and scale and size, suddenly you have a whole ton of hard problems that make the VM complicated that wouldn't be there if you were living in a smaller world. So some obvious choices, you know, uh, portable or not, does that mean you're generating machine code? Or you're not? Or are you calling using, you're building with C, C++, hotspots all C++. Uh, what are your calling conventions? On x86, there's a dozen. Uh, you have to pick one if you're going to interrupt with native code. Um, many of the calling conventions uh, date from like C, the early C years, and they are not necessarily the most optimal versions, especially for strongly typed language like Java. And so maybe you don't want to use any of the native calling conventions. This happened a lot. Um, you have threads. Are they OS threads? Are they green threads? Are you going to be POSIX compliant or not? Which way do your stacks grow? Turned out to be really pain in the butt to flip the stacks around between x86 and Spark because they grew different directions. That was woven all throughout the VM. It was very difficult to get rid of. And I've got a pretty bad feedback if somebody can tweak my audio. I don't know how to do that. OK, thank you. Um, so other games like Footprint, you have 64-bit pointers or 32-bit pointers, right? Are you talking about x86? All worlds in x86, unless maybe it's an ARM or a GPU or a DSP chip. Um, are you interpreting only? Are you jitting only? Multi-threaded. You know, if you have one thread, locking's a non-issue. If you have two threads on one core, locking uh, <laughs> da -da -da. Locking's, locking's kind of an issue. You have to think about it. Um, if you have cooperative preemption, then you always you know, cooperate to not flip a thread in the middle of holding a lock. 
Um, as soon as you have preemption, well, then you might end up uh, flipping a thread while you're in the middle of acquiring a lock. And then you have to have some sort of locking idiom that works. And as soon as you have multiple CPUs, you have to actually have an atomic operator. You cannot, it's not sufficient to do some sort of load, write, store thing. You must actually use a CAS instruction or you will be wrong. OK, better? Oh, much better. OK, interpreter choices. Um, you know, uh, simple or complicated. You write one in pure C. It's very easy to get started. It's easy to understand how a pure C interpreter works. Uh, it has a certain speed to it, all tied up with a dispatch. You go to GCC label vars, which is about twice as fast as a good C interpreter. Pure assembler, was, yeah, Hotspot had one for a long time. It's about twice as fast again. Um, we looked at hardware support at various times, various companies have. I don't think it's actually necessary. You, you want a JIT instead, obviously. But there's lots of fun ways to inline and schedule your dispatch logic. I've seen a couple different ways to slice and dice this. Um, having solid good performance out of the interpreter is actually fairly important because it's your startup time and it's your fallback position when your JIT fails. Right? You don't want to like cheat too badly here. Um, however, as soon as you have an interpreter, you typically, well, for Java at least, you have these um, stack-oriented bytecodes. The, the stack layout is sort of really bad for jitting code in general. So the interpreter, what it wants and how it looks at the stack and what the jits when, when they look at the stack are very different. And interfacing those two becomes a giant engineering mess. So if you can get away with no interpreter, your life's easier. But there are some real costs to no interpreter at all. Um, so people talk about, hey, I'm going to give up the interpreter. I'm going to have a stage zero JIT, so a template style. Just slap out uh, machine instructions as fast as I can. And then you know, there's a lightweight optimization. Um, I'll call this you know, C1, linear scan allocator, uh, some classic, uh, the obvious high payoff constant folding, CSE kind of things, inlining, obviously. Or you know, C2, which is every possible bell and whistle you can imagine, graph counting allocator. Um, no one says it. No one talks about it very much. But right after inlining, Graph calling register allocator is the number one way to get performance out of crap code. You get miles and miles and miles of crappy code. That's the next secret in. OK, um, you're going to intercall with native. How expensive is that? Turns out that's all about calling conventions, uh, including some fairly subtle issues with uh, what it, you do with objects and horrible register layout games. Mixed with the interpreter, that's another horrible calling convention game. Um, this is a, this is a, a reference to deoptimization. Class loading versus inlining non-finals. Uh, most other JVMs have a, an issue where when they inline a non-final, they have a line in the sand for which they cannot schedule instructions above in case you overload the non-final. And you have to slap a, an instruction down on that line in the sand and say, thou shalt not proceed past here because due to inlining, this code that follows is crap. Hotspot does something even more aggressive. We can take the uh, inlining co completely disappears uh, of non-finals and get scheduled completely throughout the code. Uh, as an expense, uh, we have a very clever deoptimization path that's sort of not, as far as I know, is not done by anybody else. I'm happy to talk to people about it later. It does have interesting performance impacts there. So stage zero JITs means you can skip the interpreter. Um, so this is template generation code. It's very low quality, but very fast generated. Typically, you can generate it in your L1 cache faster than you can read from memory. Um, so it's actually faster to generate it fresh and run it than it is to like miss from memory to get it. No funny stack layouts, that's great. That means easy calling conventions, it's less engineering. Da, da, da. Still slower than interpreting one runs code. And there's a lot of run once code at startup time, so there is a cost to doing it this way. Um, you get a lot of bulky code, which matters if you care about footprint, but it's so cheap to make, you just throw it away constantly too. So you make a, some small code cache size, and you generate the crap code in there as fast as you can, you run it, and then you throw out pretty fast. And some hot stuff sticks around, and after a while you gotta get out of this mode or you're not gonna be running all that fast. Um, but it's a great way to get started um, if you don't want to deal with the complications of intermixing an interpreter and jitted code. Um, some GC choices. Um, simple stop the world, so hot spot started. Fast, what does fast mean? Does it mean high throughput? Does it mean low latency? You're going to have a moving collector, or you're going to have a conservative collector. Moving collectors let you do compactor heap, defragmentation, you can do bump pointer allocation. Um, it has some real interesting performance gains. Um, conservative means you don't have to track all your objects. And this is a ton of engineering work. 
that uh, had to go in the, the early hotspot JITs that were, you know, the C, C++ compiler guys are all saying, you know, it wasn't worth it. Um, tried and true, this is, you know, you can make these things incrementally over time, fancy new algorithm, parallel, that's hard, concurrent, really, really hard, both parallel and concurrent, like insanely hard, many, many PhDs come out of that. Um, I've participated in a couple of such GC algorithms in the, you know, design and construction of them. Um, it can be made to work. Uh, obviously, ask people what the bug tail on CMS and G1 is. Um, I'll, I'll, I will throw the, the Azul push out here that the read barrier changing the algorithm uh, worked out a lot better and a lot easier. Um, more GC choices here, safe points versus stop anywhere. So the issue with safe points is simply find all the pointers when you stop into a GC cycle. So you're on some running thread over here. Some guy over here runs the heap out and he's a GC cycle. You're doing some unrelated thing, has nothing to do with GC and you don't care, but you gotta get stopped and have your stacks crawled. Okay, you get stopped, where are you holding pointers? Maybe they're gonna move, right? So find them. So you have a oop map at every program counter, that's too bulky. You go to interpret instructions, so you roll forward to the next uh, oop map. Maybe you have fixed oop map layouts, like all the even number stack slots have oops, and the odd number ones never have oops, and the even registers have oops, and the odds do not, and you just know oops or not. Um, I talked to Philip Pislow, he suggested this one. You're conservative on the stack, and you're exact in the heap. Sorry. Um, with the idea being in the land of 64 bit pointers, uh, false collisions between a pointer and an int are kind of rare. And uh, so you can get away with being conservative at least some of the time. And so you just be conservative on the stack and you get some crap extra dangling pointers that you can't move, um, but then be exact in the heap. Um, whereas if you go to a, a safe point, then when you stop, however that stopping happens, you stop at a point where you have an oop map and you have a mapping for what is a pointer. Um, and furthermore, you can change those pointers uh, by updating the hardware registers and then reloading and going again, right? And then how do you stop? Um, turned out that uh, Azul tried it a couple different ways, but polling in software is fine. Um, you have to have some cheap way to, to pull, but an x86 will do a, you know, a load from cache and predicted branch with you know, essentially no cost. It's just like free. Um, preemption can preempt you in the wrong place. It's just talking about segment with threads, meaning you're not at a safe point. Um, and that means if you have a thousand runnables on your 32 core machine and you stop into a GC cycle and 900 of the runnables are not at safe points, you have to roll them all forward to safe points before you can do something with them. Um, different people have tried different things. What I ended up doing at Azul, it worked out really well, was simply have a callback from the OS saying, you're about to run your time slice out, find a safe point. And then when you did, you told the OS, I'm, I'm out. And if you didn't, you took too long, then he pulled you off the hard way. And if a GC cycle came along, then we took the latency to roll that guy forward. But most threads, most of the time, would always be stopped at safe points, even if they were runnables. And that meant when it was time to do a GC cycle, you didn't have to roll anybody forward. You, you had all their stacks ready to go. Um, <clears throat> Multi-threading costs. All your operations are no longer atomic. You can preempt it inconveniently in the middle of, say, a locking idiom where you've done some sort of load compare and, and not yet the CAS or I don't know what. Um, you know, I have to have locking, you didn't need it before. So simple VMs can skip locking in lots of places where complicated ones cannot. Threads obviously can block for IO. Um, GC requires you to have a stack pointer and a program counter. So obviously you should be able to go ask a thread for his stack pointer and program counter, except that the most OSs, well, every OS I've tried on the planet, this has failed with low frequency and giving me rarely a crap stack pointer for which the stack crawl is now wrong and you're crash and burn. Um, a lot of what I did at Azul was headed for cooperative multi-threading, but there was always a preemptive backup plan. So the performant low latency, so performant not throughput, but performance for latency was all done with cooperation. Yeah, what, 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 you spent some time looking at cooperation versus back to a really true block environment like back to the GC cycle. Like, what's the, well, but it seems like, it seems like, you know, you, you can solve some of the problems that you're having here if you're able to discover inside a VM about the, you know, about the 
So that's what I mentioned before. We had the OS just issue a callback to the process saying, yeah. And then you still had to be preemptive in case you were wrong, in case you didn't honor the, the callback, in case you weren't going to be cooperative, right? So some guy's in a badly written mem copy loop, and he's just going to run this gigabyte through, and it's going to take him a while, right? And the OS says, oh, I want to do a GC. And he says, oh, sure, in a couple seconds, right? And everyone else is now blocked. So you have to be preemptive, right? Um, it, 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 but, but you can get away with it mostly, mostly good. It's in Red Hat, the main distro. It's like. Okay. Um, as soon as you have multiple CPUs as opposed to multiple threads, you have to have atomic operations, not just locks. So you have to have CAS instructions. You have to have coherency issues. You have memory fences. You have to honor the Java memory model. You have to know what the hell the memory model is and how it maps onto your hardware. You end up with low frequency data race bugs with a long bug tail to go hunt down and track. Right? So you have to expect much harder uh, debugging now. You have to have scalable locks in your JVM holding all the Java virtual machine internal resources have to be in some sort of scalable locks because a lot of threads might pile in on a class loader trying to load new classes or to confirm that a class is loaded while somebody else is trying to inject or whatever the hell it's going to be, right? So not just for correctness, but they have to be scalable for performance. You have to be able to JIT those same locks into the running code where the thousand runnables are actually trying to compete for some stupid ass lock. There has to be spinning and retries. There has to be fair locks under super high contention, or else you get thread starvation, issues like that. So these make the locks much more complicated than what would happen if you just like, hey, I'm going to do the obvious thing here. Um, you know, you have to work hard to make these work well, right? GC can be in progress, obviously, when a thread awakens from a lock or native code or whatever. And therefore, the threads now need to take some form of a GC lock in order to be able to run. As they come out of the native code, they come out of the locking idiom, maybe their stack's in the middle of being rewritten by GC. Um, they have to have a GC lock before they're allowed to run. So there's some atomic operation that's competing with the GC that has to happen before they can go. Are you building fairness into your locks on top of what the OS gives you? Uh, yes, because the OS does not give fair locks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Anyone who runs a big, busy web server and gets thread starvation is like a lost customer. The guy's waiting and waiting for Amazon.com to say, we love you, we sold you this thing. And they get tired and they like bail out, go to eBay. So Fairlocks had to be there. And it didn't have to be perfect. It just had to be, you can't starve some poor slob. And the OS says, I got 1,000 runnables and 32 cores. I'll put eight on each run queue. And now I've got, I got 100 threads runnable and you know, 800 or not. The 800 or the not never run. And, and then they starve out, right? People time out, transactions die, things fail out left and right. It just sucks. You, know, you, had, to, you had to do something smart there. Uh, yes, so we, we played games there too. Okay, um, here's a stupid hack. 64-bit math, the major usage of longs turns out to be the big integer package doing crypto by web services everywhere, like who'd have thunk? Well, big integer uses is always really as a pair of ints with a carry between them, where you mask off one half, you mask off the other half, you load this half, you shift it right, you shift it left, da da da, the dance and dance, dance. It works out really well as a pair of ints. Turns out that a pair of ints with a carry, um, and C2 still has support for this in it, works out as well as really straight up good 64 bit code because of the number of uses where you actually really only want one of those 32 bits or one of the other. You don't want to load 64 and then mask or load 64 and shift. You actually want to load four of the other side and then be done. Who'd have thunk, right? Okay, so now I'm going to go take a deep dive in native calls. It's like a day of doing native calls. Um, and, and I'm going to pick on Spark. So it's beat on Spark day. So this is old Spark chips. And I'm picking on Spark only because it's exemplary for being bad. But the same issues arise on various calling conventions on the 86 and on ARM and on Itanium in different ways. But it's the same general problem. So ideally, you'd like to believe I'm going to make a native call. I can just actually use the hardware's call instruction. It should be really fast, really simple. And for small embedded systems where well, I know that my target code is cooperating with me, he's going to be polite about GC, he's going to be polite about safe points, he's going to follow the rules, 
Um, that holds true. But as soon as I say I'm going to call some random piece of code that I have no idea where it came from, I have to be defensive. As soon as I have to go to the defensive place, things get complicated fast. So standard sort of calling convention on a Spark, register window push, same on x86, you're going to push the BP register to make a stack frame. You're going to do an argument shuffle. One of the registers is in the wrong place, fine. You make your call. You're going to shuffle the return result back and, and unwind the stack, however that's done, return. Yeah, it looks easy. So obviously the registers are wrong because I'm passing a double. And on C, the native code, because they do printf, they like to have their floats and their doubles and their ints all run together in the same register set, in the same order, so var args works. And that means that your doubles get passed in the int registers. Whereas on Java, with its strong typing, you know that doubles are, could be kept in double registers, and doubles can call registers, or routines with doubles in the double registers. And that's, in fact, what happens when I have uh, uh, control on both sides of things in, the, in Hotspot. Um, but in the case of Spark here, I had to shuffle, and there wasn't a, a reg reg move between the float and the int registers. So it had to pass it to the stack. So you had to have a hole in the stack for it, and you had to store it down and load it up. And the this pointer is in 0, so the double comes up and misaligned 0102, so you can't even do a single load. But this is, you know, I'm, uh, that's just me picking on Spark now. OK, so the next thing is that I can't trust the native code to be nice with my oops. So I have to hand him a pointer to an oop, a handle, instead of the oop itself. So I'm going to handleize the oops as part of my argument shuffle. And that means I'm going to take a, you know, I'm going to do the null check because a null, a handleable null is a null. And then I'm going to store the damn thing down into some place on the stack and put the address, and that's the handle, and hand that to the native code. And of course, I have to reverse out in the way back. If he hands me a handle back, I have to say, is it a null? Oh, not. OK, then load it and go again. So this is me uh, being defensive against the native code, um, hiding oops from the GC when he blocks for IO for the next decade. Maybe I need to lock him. I'll, I'll cut short the eye chart, but it's basically the obvious. Grab some bits out of the header word, scribble with them, store some bits somewhere else, do a CAS instruction, and then unwind that uh, with a CAS again on the tail end when you come out. Um, I have to do stack crawls for GC, um, but GC needs a stack pointer and a PC, which the portable OSs won't give us, at least not reliably. So I'm going to store it down before I call the native code. So that is, you can't read it now because uh, the chart's off the bottom, but basically says build a constant, which is a return program counter. Um, it's a unique token specifying the call location. Isn't that a cool trick? It tells me exactly where this call site is. It's your return PC. On, a, on an x86, I get it a different way, but there's some way to get that damn return PC right as a constant. And I store it into some place in thread local storage. Um, on Azul, thread local storage for any given thread was found by masking off the low order bits because all our stacks were too mega aligned. So there's some cheap way to get thread local storage, and you store this thing down, you store it on your stack pointer. That store of the stack pointer is the atomic op that enables the stack crawl. And as soon as that goes down, the very next clock cycle, the GC can take the stack lock by casing on the stack pointer value and then owning the thread stack, scribble with it to his heart's content. And if the guy comes out of the call of the native code, he has to take the lock from GC. Again, at the bottom, can't see, but the I chart is basically cas my stack pointer back down, hoping to put a null over the stack pointer. If I win, I own my stack, I can go. And if I lose, somebody else owns my stack, and I have to go, go to sleep somewhere and wait for GC to be done. Usually, actually, what happens here is you, you run off and immediately try to do the work of crawling your stack with the GC so you can get moving again. There's some you know, lock-free idiom or wait-free idiom you want to do here. But you have to do a CAS op with the GC. Um, odds and ends for the JNI calling convention. You need the JNI env environment, which is just some place in thread local storage. You, as a service for native code, you have a temporary handle set that you let them have a stack of handles, and then you push and pop it. So you store the address of it in the beginning, and you reset at the end. And the native code can make handles really quickly and cheaply, and then you can throw them away fast. So there's a little extra work there. Uh, profiling tags, different times I've done plus plus on stack counters, so how many times a native call gets made. Or set a tag down um, so I'm in it. And then if you do a later do a stack crawl across all your threads, you can say, what native code a thread is in or not, and then you can do good uh, profiling heuristics after that. So then a native call looks something like this. Make a stack frame, jnimv, handleize some argument, 
shuffle the rest of the arguments around because the floats and the doubles are in the wrong place. Put your PC and stack pointer down so you can get a stack crawl. Make your native call. Grab the GC uh, lock again. Unhandleize the results. Clean your stack up return. It's like 40, 50 instructions. And all that complexity is there is because you're being defensive against what the hell a native code's going to do. You have no idea. Okay. So, um, dead silence. <laughs> More than you would think would be necessary by a fair amount, yeah. Yeah, I didn't go to the cases where like, oh, you had to pass 20 or 30 arguments for some of these you know, swing calls, and then you have to like, make a huge stack slot, and you have to put handles in the stack slots, not just handles and registers, and it just goes on and on and on. Never mind, okay. You didn't select your register window. Uh, I don't have to. We, we, you, you do, you do if you fail the GC lock, but not if you don't. Okay, fine. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about things that worked well, things that I did that I would do again. So I love the notion of safe points. They seem to work out really well in practice. Easy for the server compiler to track and optimize. And actually, this was key. Um, it's not just for GC. Also, this is your DOP point. This is your unwind from a broken optimization point. And so um, you have to have a complete state map for how to go from uh, you know, the generated machine code to some architecturally defined Java point. Java bytecode point, right? Okay, so this, this mapping is complicated and full-fledged and fairly tricky, um, and keeping it right means you're carrying a lot of state around, and the state's expensive to carry around, so it hurts performance. So if you never deop, you can throw away all this dead crap, but if you're gonna deop, you have to like rebuild the interpreter state, even if the JIT can prove that this variable is dead, the interpreter is gonna use it and do something with it, right? So you have to carry the value along for the interpreter. Then the guy can break and look in his debugger and get the variables out, right? Even though they're dead by execution. Um, so you don't want so many of them. Defining them as a safe point instead of everywhere means in between safe points you can optimize the hell out of things. And so the, the C2 aggressively removes them, stretches them out, makes them as far apart as you can get, as long as every code path has one somewhere, so you can take a GC. Usually there are a thousand instructions apart or further, but in a modern x86, thousand ops is, you know, nanoseconds, I don't know what the hell, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, so safe points come often enough, but when they're stretched out like a thousand apart, the amount of extra state you're carrying along from from one point to the next can be reduced by a lot. Um, the next thing you can do is when you stop a thread, you can tell him to do many self-service tasks. In particular, his own cache is hot in his own, his own stack is hot in his own cache. So if you want to do a GC crawl on a running thread, don't have a GC thread crawl that thread because everyone's caches are all wrong. Tell that thread, crawl your damn stack. And then Come up with a list of oops and put them down in your own memory space somewhere. And later in the background, the GC thread can come by and scrape them and say, thank you, mister, for your stack roots, and carry on, right? Turns out polling was pretty cheap. On x86, as I mentioned before, grabbing a, a bit from thread local memory was, you know, mass the stack pointer, compare against a branch that's perfectly predicted, and, and away you go. It was just dirt cheap. And then the cooperative preemption we talked about already. Um, heavyweight JIT compiler, another thing that I think worked out really well in practice. This is what gave Java the reputation that it was as fast as C. It was this heavyweight compiler for peak performance. And when we first started down this path, we didn't know how heavyweight we could be and still be okay. So the early versions of C2 were in fact really fast, as fast as C1 is now. Um, and over time, I could get more peak performance by slowing the JIT down. And everyone would say, no, no, it's too slow, it's too slow, but we want a better spec score. So better spec score it was, every time. And then you got more and more and more optimizations, and it turned out things like the loop optimizations, which sound very heavyweight, loop unrolling, loop peeling, invariant code motion, uh, range tech elimination by doing uh, loop cloning, the start and end loops and stuff like that, um, actually fairly cheap to do. And they paid off massively. You got C or Fortran speeds out of the inner loops. If you had a straightforward, uh, striding stencil style calculation inner loop. Same code as a C compiler, same performance as a C compiler. Cool stuff. 
uh, and we can't because Java arrays are uh, ragged. So there is a well understood hack for doing it, but no one's paid the engineering costs to go there. I could tell you how to implement that, but it's you know a couple man years to go burn. But then you, then you could you could get there. You could do loop tiling and stuff like that in Java. It's possible. Um, graph IR. So it's very non-traditional, but it turns out to be very fast and light. Once you understand how it works, it's like graph rewriting rules. Um, it's very easy to extend. Throw in a new node in the graph IR and add optimizations that do, it's, it's all people optimizations. 99% of C2 ops, people optimizations. <coughs> now finally, the last piece of the resistance, the graph calling allocator, it is robust in the face of over inlining. And that is crucial because it means I, can, I don't have to tune the inlining knob so tightly. So the common bad pattern for register allocators, and I've written at least eight in my life, of which at least three have been in common widespread production use, is that once you get too much register pressure and begin to spill, one good spill deserves another. So there's a real threshold, and past it, your performance tanks, and you're all ton full of spill code. So I worked hard, diligently, um, to make that allocator be robust in the face of over inlining, where if you began to spill, you just spilled as if you would be doing call or call save, and you had an inline. You know, the goal of inlining is to let you have more scope and do more optimizations around the inline stuff. If you fail to inline in with call or call save, register shuffle games right at the call boundaries, and then you're running the hardware, you know, hardware's running the instructions in the middle anyhow. Um, if you over inline, if you inline, you get rid of the caller, caller save boundaries, and maybe there's some code ops across the, the fuse boundaries. Well, that's great. If you over inline, you begin spilling. If the spill costs are no more than caller, caller save costs, then it didn't cost you anything to inline. Right? You didn't lose for inlining. So once we got that fixed, we could crank up the inlining knob a lot. And occasionally it would over inline, and occasionally it was useless, but it didn't matter. It was just as good as not inlining. But if you went the other way and you failed to inline, Life can frequently suck, as attested by everybody who's complaining about method handle performance. You know, once that call chain hits the nine, a number I wrote 20 years ago, I did pick nine, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> now you know. You know, it fails to inline, and then, you know, performance just tanks. So inline is the crucial optimization, but Getting the allocator to not spill when you've over inline is the thing that makes over inlining possible. I would add that um, turning into some kind of region based graph using allocator usually makes the spills even better if it's got lots of spills. So it's just variables every once in a while and they kind of spread things like that. So it, it's actually very much a region based allocator under the hood. If you go stare at what it does, it breaks up things by frequency groups and with disjoint sections between them, and tries very hard to spill around regions of similar high frequency. There's high pressure notion and a high frequency notion. I can, I, I, well you can get better and worse. Here's the trick. You have to get, on average, better allocations. But when I, whenever I went into hotspot and went to get for more performance out, the number one place I could get it was this guy. Because it's the handling the miles and miles of crap code well is the key to getting performance out. You can't do it. There's no magic bullet optimization. That's what I'm saying. There's none of these like loop invariant code motion. Those things weren't applying on all the crap code. It's the register allocator. OK. Um, other things that worked out well, portable stack crawling code. Um, I needed a notion of a stack pointer in a PC. I needed a notion of go be the next stack frame, the next, the next. Basically a frame iterator for hardware stack frames. Turns out this works for a wide range of CPUs and OSs, including with you know, Itanium register windows, Spark register windows, register windows, and Azul register windows, which are all different forms of register windows, and people who didn't have register windows. Um, people had multiple different kinds of stacks. Um, frame adapters, as opposed to adapter frames, if you've been in the guts of Hotspot for a while, you've probably seen adapter frames. So a frame adapter is one where I am uh, adjusting the call layout from one kind of call to another. I'm going from an interpreted call to a jitted call, from a jitted call to a native call, or back. And I want to shuffle the registers. The exact shuffle depends on the signatures involved, but nothing else. So it's a little snippet of code that says, uh, shuffle register A to B, C to D. It's a parallel reg reg copy operation. Uh, and then jump on to some other place. And all you're doing is to shuffle. It's the same as what method handles basically do. It's an argument shuffle and go. Um, 
once you get this thing figured out, um, it's really cheap and it lets you jump between different layouts for different generator, code generators really quickly. The notion of a code cache. One of the key things that didn't seem like key, but it does now, is that all your code lives in the same 4 gig space, even on a 64-bit VM, so that you can use a 32-bit program counter everywhere. You can use the cheap version of the local call instruction instead of a 64-bit call, which typically has a lot more overhead and cost to it. So big savings on both x86 and Spark and most of the risks I looked at versus some sort of far call. Um, so the code is contained within a four gig region, it didn't matter where. <coughs> blah, 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 a lot of debugging flags. I think somebody else mentioned this here. Um, Hotspot has a lot of them. And what they're really doing is testing all the rare one-off cases. So you know you have some semantics to match. Mostly the good thing happens. You allocate, it's a bump pointer and you're done. Every now and then the bad thing happens. The, the heap ran out and you had to do a GC cycle. The class got loaded and the code you generated is crap. The, uh, the lock you were trying to acquire was in fact contended and now you have to go to sleep in the OS. So in all those rare one-off cases, you make them common by doing these a lot flags. Say, the cool optimization I did to make bump player allocation work failed, call into VM as if a GC cycle um, has happened. And immediately VM does shit like, oh, you should have to get a safe point. Let me go verify that you in fact are and that I'm tracking all the oops. So things like that. So you get all kinds of great asserts and stuff. A lot of bugs pop out very easily here. You can stress test all these uh, cases very easily. You can hand it to the QA department and say, add this flag and run a long time, because things obviously get slow, because you're cutting out the fast path. Um, but you get a lot of bugs caught a lot really quickly. Thin locks. Bacon bits, hot spots, thin locks, whatever. I've seen a dozen different names for it. Basically, it's CAS on an object word to own the lock. Um, CAS on the unlock hardly matters because it's all cache hot now. If you successfully got the lock, um, if you ran a long time, then the cache miss didn't matter. But if you ran a short period of time and you unlock, well, it's in your cache, so it doesn't matter either. So it's just CAS on the lock that counts. Um, uh, this is old now. I don't know if it's is a bias locking on. Azul turned on bias locking years ago. But its sun was slow, but I thought it was getting there. It's off? It's on. It is on. OK, fine. So this is just saying. It was interesting. Um, too many Java locks are never contended. You want a thinner lock, which is, you know, I own it, but I don't. And then eventually, if somebody actually wants it, you have to go find out what's really going on. And Java memory model, I was certainly there before the memory model came out. I did the first reference implementation of memory model work. Um, obviously, in practice, that has worked out really well because we all do Java util concurrent, blah, 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 forever in a day. OK. Hard things, but worth doing. So things that took a lot of more engineering work than I thought they would. Uh, being portable. Um, being portable was a giant pain in the buck, but, but what it did was it made the system, it, it separated out implementation from architecture in a great way. So the ideas, the architecture was an implementation got split. You got much better code discipline. And suddenly, things got a lot easier to understand what was intended. There was an implementation of, oh, here's how you crawl a stack. And then there was uh, a garbage collector wants to crawl the stack and find all the oops. And the implementation of crawl the stack is not anything that GC guys really care about. They just want a collection of oops that are root set and go, right? So there's a lot of places where this turned out to be really well. How you do uh, an inline cache, how you do uh, uh, any of the code cache games at all, um, how you intercall between uh, uh, the interpreter that you're trying to write in some portable, portable way versus the jitted code. Um, separating these things out was forced by the port and was useful ultimately. Oh, it was a big engineering job when it first happened. And then adding a middle tier. Um, as I mentioned, I've done C1, C2. I know people have tried a lighter weight C2 versus a heavy C2. Uh, I don't know, what's the current default in hotspot? Is it C1 plus C2, or is it a, it is? Yeah, okay, yeah. For, for, server. for server, yeah. Okay, deopt, uh, I mentioned this before. Hotspot does this no cost at all to inline non finals including no line in the sand. Um, um, if you do override the code, ultimately you have to recompile, but otherwise it's full, you know, game on. Um, you have to flip your compiled frame into an interpreted frame, and it's, uh, it's not rocket science, but it is nitpicky. So just be prepared to understand the bits and bytes of stack layouts and machine instructions. But once you get it right, it's right. 
self-modifying code, there's a lot of it. Um, so you, you do a lot of code patching for inline caches. Everyone here know what an inline cache is? So who here fail, does not know what an inline cache is? Let's go the other way around. There's a handful of people. Okay, so an inline cache is the, is the thing that makes Java calls like cheap enough to bother, otherwise you never, the language would never go anywhere. It is, um, uh, by C++, things are non-virtual by default, you have to say virtual, and then you know you're getting an expensive call site where somebody does a load, load, jump register. In Java, it's the other way around, by default everything's virtual. So the obvious implementation is load, load, jump register, and actually in Hotspot it's three loads. They're all data dependent, and then a jump register, which is going to you know, cost you 30 clock cycles or something horrible. Whereas a regular call is like one clock cycle. So it's, it's, you know, it's a huge difference. So an inline cache says, gosh, the call that I took here last time around is to the same method as the call I'm taking this time around. Can't I cache it? There's one entry cache in your code. The, cache is, the key to the cache is your class. And the target of the cache is the target method as a, encoded as a machine instruction uh, directly in the call instruction. So you load the class to the object you've got. You compare it against the cache that is the class that is the cached here. If you get a hit, you take a call instruction, go into your target. And you can order the calls and the branches in different ways. It amounts to about the same thing. But it's a load, compare, branch. Uh, inline caches in practice, they either fail out right away, like you're megamorphic, that call site goes to multi-targets, or they never fail for the life of the JVM. So if they're never failing, it's a load, compare, branch call, where the load, compare, branch is entirely predicted. So the x86 just throws it through this pipeline, it takes a clock cycle to go through. Um, of course, if it fails, you have to patch the code and say, well, that didn't work. So I need to do something where I go uh, jump from the call to like a load, load, load call, um, and I have to have the right set of loads stored in there, so you have to patch the code around. And then you have to patch it in the face of racing Java threads who are busy running this code hot in their caches. They've been running it a long time, it's in their I cache, it's in all the layers of their D caches, and you're patching it, and what did they do? Well, they saw some partial piece of the, the patch they saw the before, the, ha the after, the in-between. Um, if you ever cross a cache line boundary, you can't be atomic about it. There's a bunch of issues. So patching is a pain in the butt. Um, but it can be done. And you have to make sure that, and you can't, like I mentioned, you can't do it, actually you can't do an atomic update here. Um, you can, it helps, but you can't across cache line boundaries. So some parts of, of instructions are not allowed to cross a cache line boundary so that you can patch them. Therefore, sometimes you put NOPs in in order to push the thing to not uh, misalign on a cache line. Um, to do this, Hotspot uses a high level language assembler. So you're writing assembly code by hand, except you're actually writing C code, which looks like assembly code, but when it runs, it just emits that assembly code into a buffer. Da, 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 it's very easy, right? Oh, but you get all kinds of cool invariants provided by this high-level assembler. He will check that you didn't break any of the rules. He'll check that you're doing the right register set. He'll check that you, you're not uh, missing the safe point or making a blocking call by accident. Um, he'll, he'll check that you don't have the, uh, yet insert the right NOPs for these inline cache patching things. Um, there's other places where you have instructions that you know have to be patched, and so they also have to be aligned. Um, you get all kinds of cool support out of this. And then when you're done, he like marked all the places where you had inline caches, because they have to go in the OOP maps and the DOP maps and such, so you can find them and patch them later. Um, if you have a GC point, he marked that. If you have uh, other kinds of calls and stuff, there's a bunch of things he does. So this notion worked out really well. You're writing assembly code by hand, because instruction by instruction, you have to know what it does. But then there's a lot of times that you want some help, and you can get automated help out of this thing. Azul went to a single word header on a 64-bit VM. Um, turns out that's actually pretty substantial savings in memory, which turns into speed in your caches because your objects all shrank by one object word, uh, and therefore you got that much more in your first level, top level D cache, right? So to make that work, instead of using a 64-bit class pointer and header, we have a class ID. So we came up with the notion of however many bits you want, 16 is too few, but 19 or something does it. Um, also in there, we had a thread ID, which I mentioned before, we took threads by uh, chopping off the low order bits to get the thread level storage. Well, the same trick was just shift it right, and that's your thread ID. Um, and then we had more bits left over once we did this compression that we could get hash code, take all 32 bits, because it turns out when you have a really big VM with you know, billions and billions of objects, 32-bit hash code is getting a little scarce. You're guaranteed to get lots of hits, lots of collisions. Oh, okay, here, I just said this. 
align your stacks on a boundary, and then shove the thing right or left to get the stack ID out. Um, use a TLB page protection to catch your underflows and overflows at the edges. Um, we had various cool certs where we would protect the whole stack and say, we think everyone's at a safe point now, and we're going to crawl the stacks, um, but we're going to throw on, uh, we're going to you know, TLB read protect or re TLB write protect the stack, and then start doing our GC cycles. And occasionally you'd catch some thread that ran on past the safe point because he skipped it somehow and started scribbling on the stack, and you'd catch these bugs that way. Um, Thread pointer is very common in core VM code. Turns out getting your thread pointer is very common in hot versions of all kind of Java code, where people say thread.current to get thread local storage at the Java layer. Um, you, you get it in like one clock cycle here by just taking your stack pointer and shoving it over. With that notion that we can get at thread local storage quick, we came to the notion that we could stop individual threads with just the software polling where they, each thread asks his own thread local storage, uh, should I stop now and do something? And if he does, he discovers he has some self-service tasks to go do. Common case would be like call your self stack for GC roots, or maybe just flip all the bits on the pointers. Um, maybe you got told you took an exception. Some other thread threw a thread.death at you. Well, you're only going to install it at a safe point, but now you have to begin throwing an exception where you had no idea you would ever throw it before. Um, or you get a stack overflow, or an out of memory, things like that. You get these horrible exceptions. Revoke a bias lock. You hold down to a lock, but you didn't really, you weren't paying attention anymore, you're trying to be fast about it. Somebody else says, I want that lock, and you have it. Do you actually have it, or are you just like lying about it? And he has to crawl his own stack and discover if it's locked or not. So it's a self-service lock tax. Same for debugger hooks, conditional breakpoints, inspection the stack. Uh, cleaning inline caches. Turn out the inline caches I was just talking about. There's a bunch of phase transitions you can do, and then provably there's a final phase transition which you can never do unless everyone's at a safe point, and that is you can't clean the inline cache and reset it. And I can talk to people about why that is what it is, but it can never be undone unless everyone is guaranteed not in the middle of an inline cache idiom. Um, and you do that by stopping people this way. So, and then the cooperative preemption was another obvious case that we went to. So we had a lot of fun use cases for safe pointing single threads. So no, it, what we have now does, okay. So Azul certainly had hardware transactional memory. We played with it for a lot of choices. Um, actually for the inline caches thing, the, the transition from dirty to clean is one that only needs to be taken very rarely. So it's not performance critical. The other transitions, we figured out how to do them with single word atomic patches, a series of single word atomic patches. Um, and that was cheap enough, but it was definitely, it's hard to engineer it right. And after like four times around, I know how to do it. I have a very nice little state machine I draw, and I list all the transitions carefully, and I list the instructions, the pieces are gonna change, da 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 da. And then, and then the code for it is very simple. Um, it, it, it's really, you know, it's a couple, couple of CAS instructions, it's like dirt cheap, right? So you're not worried about performance changing the state on it. You're mostly worried that the guys screaming through it at full speed get the right answer. Okay, things that I did that I won't do again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Write a VM in C++. <laughs> so Java's fast now. And in particular, mixing oops in a non-GC language is a total pain because in the hotspot VM, the this pointer is frequently an oop. And if you span a call that takes a block for any reason or allocates for any reason, the this pointer as an oop might get moved up from under you. Now the C++ compiler has no clue that that happened. So he might have the old version and he might have the new version, he might intermix the two, you might be stomping the old one, dude, whatever, fine, oh my god. So you had to wrap every this pointer reference accidentally that might happen across a handle, and you had to have some sort of support to track them or else you failed to wrap them, and it was just endless grief. <clears throat> um, well, I just said Java plenty fast now, but there are other languages floating around there as well. But I would write one in a language that knows about the oops directly. So the, the hard, now, hard piece would now be getting the garbage collector to be written in the language that it's been, you know, in its own self language. And that one I've seen people attempt, and I don't know how well that actually would work out in practice. But like the rest of the VM having to do with class loading and uh, jitting code, you know, all the runtime support for managing the jitted code, uh, it's all 
easily done in Java. In fact, at Azul, we put all the, uh, the perm gen went into the main, there were no perm gen, goes in the main heap. The jitted code goes into the main heap as well. So all the lifetime management of the jitted code is done by the garbage collector. There's a ton of that stuff that we just like, yeah, why are we, hell are we managing it for? So there's a lot of roll your own mallocs. You look at hotspot right now and count the number of times people have a better way to manage memory that's not GC, but it's, it's stacks, it's regions, whatever, C2's got plenty of them. Um, they're like 10 at one point, I counted a ton of them. Um, C2 does burrs, bottom up pattern matching. Um, kind of useful if you're writing to a vax. Uh, <laughs> never needed on a RISC chip, never needed on an x86, at least not for a long time now. x86 architecture is actually fairly regular. Um, the actual encoding the instructions is kind of bizarre, but the use of one register for whatever location, that's all, it's all the same. And furthermore, dropping or adding an instruction here and there because you didn't get it perfectly correct is like not interesting for performance. Um, but it adds this giant level of indirection in the JIT engineering um, to get the, you know, the generated code out from the guy who's doing the generating. They have a, you know, it's like playing the piano with boxing gloves on. The layout of indirection is just in your way. I claim no. I claim it is not easier to maintain. It is not. You could do something with just C++ overloads for code emission. That would be uh, one hell of a lot easier. In general, then say yak. Oh, no, I wouldn't use yak either. No, I would never do any of these tool. No, I'm never, I would never use a tool in between the code gen and the compiler like this again. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I have done this repeatedly and, and all Compilers since like the 70s were always using some flavor of version yak and lex whatever the hell is a tool between the optimization end and the code generation end. And that thing was always like in the way, but not so badly in sort of a classic C compiler mode. But in Hotspot where I had to have fine control over what was an OOP and what wasn't, who was being tracked and where you can align instructions or not, crap like that, it was always just in my face. Um, I'm serious. We, we can go down that line if you want, but I've done this for a long time, and I swore at this thing endlessly. <laughs> Never, ever do it again. Okay. Um, Hotspot used to have patch and roll forward safe points. I don't know if they still have them. Um, it made it very, very heavyweight to safe point a single thread. At Azul, the cost to safe point a thread was you set a bit, and you waited, and you waited usually less than 1,000 clock cycles, and then he was safe pointed. Um, and so that was just so much faster than what Hotspot has been doing, um, which was uh, 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 stop the thread, ask for his PC, patch the code he's in full of breakpoints, and then restart him, and then some other thread you didn't want to stop had to have the non-patched version. You had to have two versions of code, patched and not patched. Occasionally the OS told you the wrong thread, and you patched the wrong thread, and you waited a while, and he didn't actually stop because you didn't patch him. The, thread he was in, the, the code he was in, and it was just like a giant mess. Um, just Pulling, it totally did. I, 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 in fact, I'm sure I fought for it, you know, 20 years ago, and now I'm going to fight against it. Um, generic call save registers. Um, it made it a real mess to crawl stacks. Um, X86 never really had enough registers to need them. Um, register windows work fine, or uh, almost unrelated. Um, but, but there's only a few uh, hardwares that have many common registers and no register windows for which you might contemplate call AC registers being useful, but they're not worth the engineering cost to maintain a stack crawl on them. Does people know what, what I'm talking about here in the call saves? The issue is somebody called you and you promised them that you're going to save register RDX or whatever your call save register is. So you save RDX and you restore it when you're done. You block for a GC somewhere in the middle. Is RDX contained an OOP or not? Well, you don't know. You just got told to save this register. Well, Different call paths will have it as an OOP or not. So you have to go up to the caller and ask him, hey, did you pass RDX? What was it? Was it an OOP or not? Well, he said, oh, I, I copied it from RCX and got it from somewhere else. And you have to call again, again, again. And actually, it can be exponential. This is not even a linear chain. So it's just like nastier than hell. OK. Adapter frames versus frame adapters. This is a thing that I put in, and, and I totally regretted it. Um, and this was a way to do a shuffle between registers, as I mentioned before, except the adapter frame left a frame on the stack as opposed to a frame adapter which just did the shuffle and there's a tail call out of there. It didn't leave a frame on the stack. When you leave a frame on the stack, the extra frame screws up all kinds of things having to do with stack crawls because it has no semantic meaning to anyone else. It's just there as a leftover from, from reorganizing the, the arguments. 
It does let you reorganize the return address. Um, and if you don't have one, then it means the return register has to be the same for interpreter and jitted code, which is not typically an issue. You're just going to pick a register that you're going to return a value in, and everyone agrees that that's the register they're going to turn in. Um, uh, don't do it. Don't, don't put any extra frames on the stack. One frame per architected language frame or fewer if you've got inlining. Uh, constant oops in code. On an x86, it looked, x86 it looked really good as a 32-bit immediate instruction, except, of course, it would be misaligned across a cache line, so you had to patch the damn thing. Um, but on Spark and PowerPC and other risk tips, you couldn't build a 32-bit immediate, so you had to have multi-instruction patches. Um, and so because you couldn't get those atomically, you had to only patch them with all thread stop, which meant you had to stop the world pause, and the GC was required to patch the OOP and the generated running code, and then you had to flush all your iCaches. OK, fine. Instead, just pay to load the value from a table. Put in the code an offset into a table. So there's some table base plus offset. That's not ever changing. It's some constant thing, fine. And then you do a load to get your OOP out of memory. Well, you can schedule it around. It's a known latency load. It's uh, entirely friendly to all GC algorithms because they just have a big old table of oops so they can patch whenever they want, do whatever the hell they're going to do. And it turned out to be on the, on the big VMs where you had 64-bit pointers, there's much fewer instructions, too. So it was actually faster. Uh, locked object header and stack. I think Hotspot might still be doing that, um, which meant you didn't have to count a recursion count because you had instances of the locked header and the stack as your count, and it was unary counting. Um, but it was a total pain when you want to put a, a hash code in or inflate the lock due to contention or you wanted to move the thing during GC. Um, don't do it. Just, just update the header with I'm locked or not and some thread ID notion saying which thread owns that lock. And then from there, if you actually are worried about that lock, you can go to that thread and find where he took a contended lock and, and uh, track the oop from there or track the locking issues from there. OK, so I'm, I'm, I didn't even look at the time. I talk fast. It's been an hour. My voice is getting raw. I have another set of slides equally as bad as what you just saw <laughs> for code unloading and why you know, life sucks for people who have to unload code, um, especially if they want to have high performance and unload code uh, and know that no one's actually running it at any given clock cycle. But I think I'm out of time, so maybe I Q&A a little bit or something here. Well, <laughs> uh, we were on a roll. We didn't want to stop you. So, um, but uh, if you want to pick up some of your other slides, we have lightning talk slots at the end of the day. Um, okay. Uh, if people want them, I'll go in. Uh, it doesn't make sense as a lightning talk. Um, so a Q and A, and then for like one or two, and then be done. All right. If everyone's too scared, I'm going to bail. Up, oh, yeah. The question is the authority. You mentioned that for XPS handful. What's the case for the OBIS XPS handful? That was when the JIT decided that he could take, uh, due to whatever random spill decisions, this register or that one would end up in the same call he save over some call site going forward. So when you worked it backwards, you didn't know which code path he'd come through. Oh. So, like in trifinalies, there's these replicated blocks of code for the finally that you've smooshed together in the optimizer. And so you have these horrible code paths from all over that are folding down to the finally clause, which then has a call to like build a stack trace or other stupid, crazy crap. And so he took call save registers wherever they happen to be and jammed them into whatever other thing was convenient because the register allocator doesn't have any clue about these things. He's just doing live range folding left and right, right? And so you would get bizarre back live traces, you know, webs in the, in the live range that were bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. So, no, you're off by orders and orders of magnitude. Okay. So, so in a typical large Java program, um, say half of all call sites are statically determined over the JIT. And, and he does whatever he does with a static call site. He inlines, or he makes a static call, or whatever the hell. The other half go dynamic. The ones that go dynamic, 95% live as an inline cache their entire time. They take a one time cold cache go from empty to set to the inline cache, and they never change again for the entire lifetime. 
those instructions will get executed millions to billions of times, perhaps billions per second. So a lot, not, I mean, it is a, a key performance optimization. The 5% that fail out go megamorphic really fast. So like a two-way cache, you know, a two doesn't ever actually pay off. Um, if you went more than one, you usually went 20 or 30. Uh, and those guys just end up doing a load, 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 jump register, and then just pay the price and go. Uh, but for the inline caches, they, they really pay off well. Um, it's a key performance hack. Are you stressing that out with Lambda? Um, well, you know, every time that your performance sucks and you go look and you see it didn't like do, then, then the answer is, you know, you lost the inline cache game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I didn't talk about how many times you went through an optimized call where the JIT decided he knew what it was. I was talking about the number of times you actually went through, and I, I don't actually know the percentages because the inline ones, like, really in line, they disappear away. So actually counting them is pretty expensive and it screws with you, but you can do this game. So it's interesting numbers, they, they were out there. When Java was first like really exciting, people doing all this work on it, um, those kind of numbers came around as what the relative ratios were. Uh, but it, it, for inline caches, you know, it's, it's hundreds of thousands to millions of inline cache instances, each of which are running millions to billions of times. And with that, I probably should bail and let somebody else go here. Thank you.